most of those residues hygroscopic they're trying to pull water in through the coating uh, when they do that they swell creates quite a lot of pressure which can often delaminate the film and then you know that water is just going to keep or that, that kind of damp ionic mixture is just going to do its thing in a, in a, a little area that's delaminated under the coating and yeah we've all seen it the coating can't do anything to protect against pre-existing pre-existing contamination it's you know i guess in some ways it's a filter as you said it's it's preventing bad stuff from the environment uh getting through everything's permeable to water uh, uh, water vapor you know even metal over a long enough period of time so really what you're doing is slowing down the failure mechanism and you know i guess for a lot of people, as long as they can survive their warranty period, then that's good enough. That's my guess. We'll be talking about conformal coding best practices next on Reliability Matters. Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. Phil Kinner has spent his entire career working with conformal coatings, including previous employment at Concoat, Humaseal, and PVA. Phil is a specialist troubleshooter and works to analyze materials and process failures. During his career, Phil has been instrumental in the development and commercialization of the first generation of UV curable conformal coatings and has further undertaken the pioneering development of the revolutionary 2K conformal coatings. Phil is an active member of various IPC conformal coding task groups, a regular speaker at IPC and SMTA events, and is a member of the technical committee of the European SMTA chapter. Phil is also a nominated expert on the committee of IEC TC91 WG2, that's a mouthful, requirements for electronic assemblies. Hey, Phil, thanks for joining me. Uh, it's great to be here, Mike. And uh, welcome. You are not from the U.S., but you are in the U.S. right now. Uh, you're in Raleigh, North Carolina for uh, SummerCom, uh, IPC SummerCom. Is that right? That's correct. It's been hot well, and humid and uh, hopefully uh, quite productive. <laughs> Late June in Raleigh. Yeah, <laughs> it, it gets pretty sticky. It, and it'll only get worse as, as we head uh, more toward uh, the middle and end of summer. So you're you're actually here to relatively better time than oh, it could be. That's what they've all so. been telling me. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, again, welcome uh, and uh, thanks for being my guest today. So tell me, you're with Electrolube. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where were you before uh, Electrolube and what led you? Uh, so uh, I've been in conformal coating more or less my whole career. I started off um, with company Conco, who... Uh, was the European licensed manufacturer for Humacil. Um, Humacil, or well, the Chase, the company that owned Humacil, eventually bought the European licensed manufacturing concrete business. So then I became a Humacil person. I was there uh, ooh, until 2012. Um, had a couple of years out uh, selling capital equipment for PVA um, after I decided to, to leave the US um and come back to, to the uk and um electrolube um it's a company i've known for a long time um you know competitor to humusil uh we were talking there was an interest so uh, it seemed like a good opportunity and uh to get back to, to materials and, and doing what i enjoyed so um that's kind of me in a nutshell i guess excellent and i know that um electrolube has a vast, uh, pretty wide product range. Uh, what types of products does Electrolube uh, provide? Um, <clears throat> basically, everything to do with electro uh, electronics reliability, um, whether that's uh, conformal coating, which I deal with, potting and encapsulation resins, um, thermal interface materials, uh, cleaning media, and contact lubricants. Um, keeping switches functioning correctly, um, which is kind of where the business started 60 odd years ago. Hence the name Electrolube. <laughs> That's right. But it does give some interesting, uh, some interesting Google hit. 
<laughs> I can only imagine. I can only imagine the type of uh, what people are searching for and what they get might be two completely different things. Uh, correct. Uh, with, with your company. Well, it is what it is. Conformal coating is vital uh, in electronic manufacturing and, and maybe not as vital in times past as it is today because of the expansion of IOT internet of things and automotive we're taking electronic assemblies and we are carrying them into harsh environments, either on our bodies, in our clothing, uh, or, or certainly with us, uh, we're putting, uh, we're putting electronics in space and cars that go into harsh environments, down oil wells and all sorts of nasty environments. So, uh, coding seems to be even more vital today than it has been even in the recent past, is that is that uh, observation shared? Absolutely, there? Mike. I, it, it's kind of funny. Uh, ever since I started in this business twenty uh, odd years ago, uh, people were telling me they were going to design coating out on the on the next generation of product. And you know, every year sales have gone up. Um, you know, so that that hasn't really happened. And you know, I, exactly as you say. Uh, Electronics is going places where electronics have no business. Um, it, the, the electronics have become more complicated, um, much more sensitive to um, corrosion and just even you know, high levels of humidity condensation. Um, it kind of changed uh, a lot of the, the signal outputs and uh, the devices don't work correctly. So. Uh, so we see you know, more and more opportunities, um, opportunities in areas that I never expected uh, um, you know, uh, conformal coating to be used. But then, um, you know, I, when when they first put cameras in cell phones, I was kind of, you know, why why on earth are people doing this? Why would anyone want that? And now I don't have a camera, and I just use my cell phone for everything. So. You know, I guess in terms of picking future technologies, maybe I'm I'm not that great, but uh, it's um, yeah, it, it's becoming necessary to coat a lot of things that the people historically wouldn't have wouldn't have coated. Yeah, speaking of uh, cameras, I, I read an article uh, that the, that stated the iPhone is takes more pictures than any other brand of camera, more than. Nikon and Canon and whatever that more pictures are taken on an iPhone than any other form of camera. Yeah. Just to to further your point, it's uh, and I thought the same thing. Like who? Because you know the early days of flip phones with cameras, you know the cameras were pretty terrible. They, exactly. they made Polaroids look high def, right? And and uh, and who who would want a a crappy little camera in a in a phone? Uh, and now, you know. Now our cameras come with phones <laughs> more than anything else, right? Looking around, uh, you know, phones, uh, phones are anything but phones really now, aren't they? I mean, you, know, you very rarely see people talking on phones now. It's tapping away at the screen and taking pictures. Right. They're texting and, 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 and Snapchatting and whatever they're doing. Yeah. Oh, and then occasionally it rings. <laughs> what do we do with this? <laughs> um, so I, I read one of your colleagues, Alistair Little's, article on uh, top five tips to protect PCBs from harsh environments. And, and I know it, it applied um, directly to coding or sorry, to potting, but coding shares a lot of the same um, requirements that, that potting does and coding and potting both serve to protect the board and therefore increase its reliability in the field. So what I, what I'd like to do is kind of, turn that particular article into a discussion about tips to protect PCBs from harsh environments as it applies to coding and potting. We don't have to exclude our friends in the potting side of the business, but um, th they, there were several points brought up. And rather than read those points, I'm, why don't you take me through uh, some of the reasons for, for coding and some of the best practices uh, for coding okay um you know, in my mind there, there's there's five genuine reasons for using conformal coating um to protect the and they're kind of a few of them are, are kind of somewhat similar but slightly slightly only slightly different 
Um, so, you know, corrosion protection would be kind of the primary purpose you know, to prevent extraneous harmful materials from from the outside environment getting onto the the surface of the circuit board where you know you've got bias you've got probably some no clean process residues and um you know mix in a bit of you know humidity or water and um you you can see um corrosion mechanisms being driven are kind of slightly the same but quite different um application is where we're talking about condensation resistance you know, and and i guess you know immersion resistance you know when you've got liquid water in significant quantities um rather than monolayers from humidity then the corrosion mechanisms tend to go faster they tend to you know on top of the corrosion issues you've also got um you know, if the water's bridging you know, two leads on an soic or a qfp or you know you name the package then uh, there's a chance it's going to short and you know the device is 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 is, is going to fail so so that would kind of be the second reason the third reason uh, i guess would be um in, in you know some enhanced dielectric protection so enabling people to put components closer together than they would in air which is important when people are miniaturizing electronics uh yeah there's not many things that are getting bigger apart from cell phones that's right we've got we've gone full circle we've gotten uh, we went from very large brick size phones to very small phones that i don't know how they were so small they, they there's a certain fixed distance between an ear and a mouth and they tended to challenge that exactly. distance and now the bigger the better it's it's kind of gone full circle but everything inside of it is much smaller there's just more stuff inside so they may be physically large but the the, the boards inside are highly, highly miniaturized. Correct. Uh, then I guess the fourth genuine reason I see for, for using coating would be um, tin whisker mitigation. So there's hundreds of pictures on the NASA website. You know, tin whiskers are a known phenomenon. And formal coating is one of the mitigation strategies. And you know that really relies on all of the things we've been talking about, really rely on getting good coverage, good uniform thickness and an adequate coating thickness to to withstand uh, the end operating environment i guess you know that's that's kind of the four main reasons and then the fifth reason would be you know a combination of all of those things so in reality you know the coating's probably doing all of those jobs so again uniform thickness coverage making sure all the metal surfaces are well coated is really important for the coating to perform in in all of those environments i should say um, you know one of the the working groups the IPC working groups that's been led by Dave Hillman has been taking a look at you know, the typical coverage in a state of the uh, state of the industry kind of exercise where they've they've had a bunch of boards coated with a variety of different you know, regular coatings, regular processes, nothing special, nothing fancy. I think Dave was saying they'd done twenty five thousand cross sections or something measuring. You know, minimum thickness, maximum thickness, and on a variety of different component areas. And, you know, I guess uh, that's really opened some eyes. Um, you know, people talk about uh, one to three mils as a coating thickness. And, you know, we who do this have always kind of understood that's on a flat, unencumbered part of the board. Some of the designers uh, are a bit shocked, but, you know, they're not getting, you know, one three mils of, of coating thickness over uh, the edge of an SOIC lead or you know, the top of a ceramic capacitor or you know, these kind of things. Um, so I think coverage is kind of a combination of the material and the application process. And so that level of workmanship has, um, has kind of become into the spotlight a little bit and it's becoming you know, more and more obvious that if you want tin whisker mitigation, you need to have good coverage. If you want good condensation resistance, then you need to have really good coverage and really good thickness uh, you know, on those component leads to, to make sure that, that everything continues to function correctly. And I think uh, that's kind of going to be one of the real challenges for you know, the next few years as we move forward is, is making sure that, you know, that we can kind of deliver that reliably um, as an industry. Sure. Your, your comment a little while back about Dave Hillman and 25,000 cross sections uh, reminds me of the adage, it's amazing what you see when you look. And, and it kind of brings the importance of inspection. 
what uh, how important how critical is material selection when it comes to conformal coating and and go through the types of conformal coating from acrylics to perylenes and anything that's in between i guess the main type and i should know exactly how many there are but um i guess the main type acrylics silicones polyurethanes epoxies paraline or paraxylylene to not use a trade name <laughs> right we've got uh we've got a new class styrene blo- uh, styrene block copolymers the most recent class ultra thin coatings which is anything less than 12 microns so most of the kind of regular liquid coatings we're talking normally one to five mils um there's a kind of nominal thickness range the paraline generally or paraxylylene typically uh you know 10 to 20 microns that kind of range um and then the ultra thins you know there's there's a huge variety of different types of coating so some of them are nanometers in thickness some of them are you know two or three microns but to try and kind of classify them as 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 one group the the committee decided that you know, anything less than the paraline thickness was was going to be called ultra thin they each have their strengths and, and weaknesses you know the perfect coating doesn't exist yet it's always a compromise for example i mean paraline is applied in a vacuum chamber as a you know it's heated up as a dimer it turns into a monomer and then it polymerizes onto onto the surface of everything in the chamber very uniform very well controlled thickness good barrier properties uh really good really good coating but the process is slow the chambers are expensive and you know it gets everywhere so anything you don't want coated you better make sure your masking is is 100 effective because otherwise you know your connectors are going to get coated with paradine and then they're not going to work when you try and plug the next board or or part in generally you know you're going to avoid the risk of masking coatings are so thin and so non-abrasion resistant that you know you can make a, a connection mate a connector mating some of them are applied in a vacuum chamber so you know slow process expensive um some of them are applied by dipping everything in a, in a liquid which is you know super easy but the you know the issue or the main issue with 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 those types of materials is you know they're really designed to encourage moisture to, to beat off if uh you know if the board does get wet then um there's just not enough thickness there's not enough dielectric protection there to um to prevent shorting between component leads and and other areas is that an attribute of all the ultra thin coatings that they 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 lack um the ability to to fully protect an assembly from large volumes of fluids um yeah i think uh that that would be my experience so i mean there's a lot of you know a lot of people making a lot of claims on the internet um various webinars and things well it's on the internet it must be true exactly but you know my dad used to tell me that if something sounds too good to be true then it often is yeah i think I, we all learn that the hard way right <laughs> so you know it's, everything has its place and it really depends on on you know what what you're looking to protect against okay so let, let, let me take that what you just said and turn it into a, a question i'm a uh, I'm a customer for the sake of this conversation. I'm a potential customer of some kind of conformal coating product. And I call you and I say, hey, Phil, I need to buy some conformal coating for my assembly. What questions do you ask me so that you can offer the proper uh, material? So my first question would be, what temperature range is your board working in? Because if it's getting warmer than 150 c and i'm sorry i'm empirically challenged so i have no idea what that is in fahrenheit um <laughs> but if it's if it's more than 150 c then it, it, it's pretty much going to be a silicone coating because of the the, the temperature resist if it's less than 150 then everything's still still on the table after that we'll probably talk about by the way that's 302 degrees fahrenheit by the way thank you i i'll try to remember that that's, that should be reasonably easy. Just double it. See, my camera, my camera has a metric converter on it too. <laughs> <laughs> I 
you know, if we if we say the operating temperature is less than 150, all of the options are still on the table, then you know, we'll probably talk about what kind of environment we're really talking about. So, you know, if it's automotive and we're going through lots of thermal shock cycles, then you know we need to keep that in in consideration. If a consumer application then kind of trying to understand what level of protection is going to be needed. So we'd ask questions about, you know, what kind of fluids or humidities, you know, how many times it's going to go through the dew point, just really trying to establish what kind of environment is important. You know, we talk about is rework important because, um, you know, some materials are very easy to rework. So for a lot of military programs where, you know, they're looking for 25, 30 years of, of upgradability, then, you know, it's important that they can can kind of rework the coating for other applications. That's probably not so important. What materials are the easiest to rework and what materials would be the most difficult to rework? Um, so the acrylics, so yeah, acrylic materials, dissolve them in solvent. You know, they come off five minutes really cleanly, get the whole lot off and you can recoat very straightforwardly the hardest materials to rework honestly probably silicone materials they're difficult to dissolve in solvent and if you try and solder through them um, because they're more temperature resistant they they tend to put up more of a fight when it comes to to just soldering and desoldering through directly through the coating and because they're generally quite soft um, they can be a little bit difficult to abrade uh, a way they kind of get sticky and gummy and the kind of abrasion media tends to stick to it. So, uh, you know, reworking silicons can be a real challenge. Um, and then main you know, polyurethanes, kind of somewhere in the middle, you know, some of them you can remove reasonably easily with solvent. Some of them you need some more aggressive solvents. When you solder through a polyurethane, you need to be a little bit careful about what's being burnt off because you know, there can be you know, some more hazardous um, byproduct of, of decomposition so you know but you know while we're talking about that it's kind of a uh, the flip side of you know the level of protection you get so you know acrylics might be the easiest to rework but in terms of level of protection maybe you know probably on the lower level of, of protection capability so there's no such thing as the perfect coating yet hence the pros and cons hence the pros and cons of every material so you're going to ask people when i ask sell me something, what do I need? You're going to ask me uh, where it's going, right? Correct. Um, you're going to ask, uh, you're probably going to be concerned about um, the harshness of an environment. Correct. It sounds like you're also going to ask me questions about, will I ever need to rework the product? Correct. Because some are more difficult to rework than others. Um, what other type of, uh, of, of, of considerations would your customer have to advise you of to, for you to, recommend the correct material um so then it comes it sort of comes back to process if they've got existing equipment then we'd need to know what that was to make sure that uh, what we were going to recommend was going to work in their process so uh if they were using a dip tank 50 gallons of material sitting in a dip tank then uh that's open to the air then choosing a moisture curing product probably wouldn't be the, the 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 best move kind of thing if they've got robots, then we'd need to take a look at the board and try and figure out you know, what kind of material was, was going to lend itself best to, to, to that coating I guess if process. It's a vacuum deposition yeah, process. We'd be thinking about cycle kind of, time. And they have to do uh, 100,000 boards a week. That probably is a, is a deal killer right there, right? Well, yes and no. So, you know, you, you, it depends. So, I mean, for many people, they want single piece flow. Uh, so it absolutely would be a deal killer for other people. They're happy to rack up a bunch of whip. And, you know, if you've got a big enough chamber, then you, know, you load it up once, let it run for 12 hours and spread that across 100,000 boards. And you know, the cycle time doesn't look so bad. So you know, it, it really depends on the factory and the way they work as to, to, to whether that's going to be an option or not. So cycle time, application method, curing process. So, you know, if they've already got thermal ovens, then maybe they want something that cures with heat. If they've already got UV curing equipment, then, you know, chances are they're going to want a UV, material, UV curable material. If someone's applying, if someone's applying a uh, conformal coating by hand with a spray gun, for example, um, do they have to specify a UV tint to it uh, so they can inspect or, or does that just come with all the sprayables? Um, most of the materials 
contain fluorescent traces. You know, some material, oh, you know, sometimes um, people specifically don't want a UV tracer because it can put a hint of yellow into the coating, which for some LED or opto devices can can you know, create some issues with wavelength shift so yeah that's kind of really a choice you know some some people want materials that are opaque you know, to try and hide the design of their circuitry or some other reasons so anything's possible you can have it you can have coatings with without or deliberately you know opaque red black you know pick a color so so everything everything's possible in my opinion i like when i'm spraying i like the fluorescent traces i find it you know, very convenient to you know be able to see exactly what i've coated and what i haven't some people prefer spraying under white light and that's okay um some people prefer doing coating inspection under white light some prefer under fluorescent so yeah i think again you know, it's it's really down to down to, to the user and, and their preference but all of those options typically would be available so i remember you you may not have experienced this uh, growing up in the uk um, I'm not sure if this particular chain of uh, automotive painters was in the UK, but when I was young, there was, a, and probably they're still in business, uh, there's a company called Earl Scheib, and they would run TV and radio ads that they'll paint any car for $29.95, $30, $30, they'll paint any car. And I, sh when I teach workshops, I show an image of Earl Scheib and all the, all the old folks in the room kind of laugh because they remember that, that ad. And then I show a car with paint just peeling off it. And I said, the good thing about Earl Scheib is if you're, you know, if you have buyer's remorse over the color, don't worry. In three months, it'll just peel right off because they, they really practice, at least for the $30 paint job, uh, I would assume they practice no surface preparation. It was just paint it. And if there was a, if there were contaminants uh, on the surface of the old color, it, it affected the adhesion of the new paint and it would just peel off. And the, and the same happens or can happen with circuit assemblies. It, when I teach my workshops, you know, we we're talking about ways to avoid electrochemical migration and electrochemical migration is the combination of three elements on a board, a, an electrical bias. So electricity, uh, which obviously every board has and um, a conductive corrosive surface, which could be contaminants left from the soldering process like flux and, and board fab processes and component fab processes and human supplied contamination, all that in totality. And the third element is moisture. So, you know, if we can prevent, we can't prevent the electricity effectively. Uh, we can remove uh, the moisture. And, and I ask everyone by a show of hands, you know, how do we prevent moisture? And everyone raises their hands and everyone says conformal coating. And then I have to be the bad guy in the room and go, well, you know, you're not, <laughs> that's wrong. Um, and, and a lot of people today even are surprised to learn that all conformal coatings are permeable to some extent. And they will all allow over time, very small amounts of moisture, not enough to cause a short, you know, by connecting a cathode and an anode with a droplet of water as if the board was not coated but just enough so that it could react with the conductive corrosive surfaces and the electrical current to form electrochemical migration. And we have, you know, plenty of evidence and photographs of, of, of dendrites growing under conformal coating. And so a lot of, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, the purpose of conformal coating is to protect against fluid leaks and, and other environmental hazards contacting the assembly. Um, but they will allow very, very, very small amounts of moisture in just enough to create that effect, that ECM effect. So you're asking, should I clean before coating? Yeah, you know, I guess as a, as a responsible uh, supplier, making sure. Uh, I guess that let's use the let's use cars as a as an example. Um, you know, when they when they manufacture a, a car prior to the paint application process, uh, you know they'll they'll go to very great lengths to do acid dips, acid washes. To make sure that the the surface of the the metal is completely pristine before before they coat it, to make sure that you know, the paint goes on properly and and adheres properly and and you know, performs properly and gives the corrosion protection that is request is expected. Yeah. So the the, the responsible person here says, um, you know, I, I would absolutely say clean a clean surface prior to coating going to reduce the number of problems you know i understand that there's a lot of 
issues. I don't need to tell you about issues with with cleaning and you know, what happens if you partially clean and no clean and yada yada yada. But if yeah, if we make the assumption that the cleaning process is good, well under control, and, and doing what's expected, then of course that's the the ideal situation. Um, on top of that, you know, certain you know, many customers use plasma to kind of etch the the and activate the surface and and give the coating you know a really uniform surface to to adhere to so, so that's kind of what i'd like to see in the perfect world in in, in the world that i live in I, I i wouldn't even want to hazard a guess at the split but you know i would say the majority of boards that are coated are you know not cleaned there's no special surface prep um it's kind of our job to deal with whatever contamination is on the on the on the board before we coat it and go back to the car example it's like taking that brand new chassis driving it around a field and then putting it on the paint line and 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 expecting to get the same pristine finish that that we got from the from the you know all the acid preps that that people were using before so i'd like to see cleaning i'd like to see plasma several years ago i consulted on a civil litigation matter where an oem was suing their contract manufacturer basically for doing exactly what they were told to do. The OEM suggested that they should have known better. <laughs> so, but the, but the premise was uh, they, they had a part that, that was backed up by a battery. This particular assembly ran off a battery and would be buried in the ground and, uh, and send signals to an adjacent receiver on a utility pole. And because the, the board was going to be buried under the ground, they thought it would be a good idea to pot the board. And so they potted it in, black silicone, you know, at, at least an inch high. They, they floated it in this plastic assembly and then just filled it with potting compound. And they didn't clean their boards. They didn't uh, remove any of the flux. They had a, a uh, they didn't bake their boards out either prior to potting. And, but they thought everything was okay because they're going to, they're going to pot it. So that was their go, get out of jail free card. And it turned out they created this sarcophagus of of, it was like King Tut in all of his possessions, you know, entombed in this potting compound. And what they did is they sealed in the sins of the, of the process uh, in, into the assembly. And although moisture did not penetrate inch thick silicone, that part was accurate. There was enough moisture already in this multi-layer board to combine with the contamination, the residues that were on the board. And they actually had conductive filament failures and dendritic growth and corrosion within this potted part. And they thought they were protecting it from the outside world. They were really making sure the, the bad actors couldn't get out. They were locking them in the same room and they all had a fight with each other. So, you know, that, that is, a, a, to me, a great illustration of, you know, you have to prep the assembly in order to protect it further through the use of conformal coating or potting. It's, it's kind of garbage in, garbage out. Absolutely. You're never going to get me to argue with you on that one. You know, and most of those residues, hygroscopic, they're trying to pull water in through the coating. Uh, when they do that, they swell, creates quite a lot of pressure, which can often delaminate the film. And then you know, that water is just going to keep, or that, that kind of damp ionic mixture is just going to do its thing in a, in a, a little area that's delaminated under the coating. And yeah, we've all seen it. The coating can't do anything to protect against pre-existing pre-existing contamination. It's you know, I guess in some ways it's a filter. As you said, it's it's preventing bad stuff from the environment uh, getting through. Everything's permeable to water, uh, uh, water vapor, you know, even metal over a long enough period of time. So really, what you're doing is slowing down the failure mechanism. And you know, I guess. For a lot of people, as long as they can survive their warranty period, then that's good enough. But you know, the the, the risk is always there. You know, and I guess you know, process variations. You know, you might get a bit more flux some days than others, and you know, you might find that some boards fail a lot faster than you know, than you than you'd expect. So, you know, it's very much a it's very much a risk. So, where do you see your industry? the coding industry and the electronics in industry in general, five to 10 years from now, did you see a trajectory or, or what's your prediction? Based on my cell phone camera prediction, uh, <laughs> I think um, yeah, it, look, everything that's made is going to, you know, is you know, there's going to be more and more um, electronics. They're going to do more and more things. They're going to be more powerful. They're going to be smaller. You know, they're going to need to be lighter. So I think, 
you know, one of the things I see is housings and the quality of the housings becoming uh, increasingly uh, less robust. I see electronic going ever goofier places. I see, and I see coating really going. It's goofier. Is goofier a technical term? It's a, well, that depends. I like it. I like it. Uh, we're putting electronics and goofy. That there's there's the headline for the, there's the title for this episode: uh, electronics and goofy places. I love it. So I, I think you know for, for for me, I see coating going in in two kind of opposite tracks. I see the ultra thin materials becoming more common for lower value consumer goods. Perhaps you could argue whether a thousand dollar iPhone is a low cost uh, or a low value consumer item, but you know, and then I see for kind of more industrial and more automotive, I think um, I think that the coatings are going to become thicker. I think they're going to because you know the the coverage the that we talk, talked about earlier to to get enough coverage and enough thickness to to deal with reduced quality housings to do with um, increased risks of humidity um, co- well condensation and immersion kind of conditions forming so uh, you know i see i see it's inevitable that, that the coatings are going to have to become a little bit thicker in order to to deal with 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 those challenges very good uh phil kinner electrolube thank you so much for being my guest today you're a wealth of knowledge when it comes to conformal coating I, I really appreciate you being here how do how do people uh, get a hold of you if they if they just say i need to i need to order some conformal coating from phil or i need to talk to phil about my process how do they get a hold of you they can look me up on linkedin uh or they can send me an email at phil.kinner at electrolube.com Electrolube, not to be confused with any other um, stray stray search term. So, uh, Phil, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for uh, joining me today. It's been a thrill. It's been a pleasure, Mike. Thank you. Well, that's another episode. Thanks for listening to Reliability Matters. If you like what you hear, please be sure to give us a like. Just click the like or heart button below. If there are any reliability-based questions you'd like to have answered or specific topics discussed, let me know. I can be reached at mike at mikeconrad.com. That's Conrad with a K. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe to Reliability Matters on iTunes or follow us on Spotify. You can also listen to us on iTunes, Spotify, aqueoustech.com, pcbchat.com, spreaker.com, or our newest affiliate, Ascendo Reliability on reliability.fm, a site dedicated to all things reliability. Once again, thanks for listening. We'll be back soon with another episode of Reliability Matters. In the meantime, keep doing it right. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Join us on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for new episodes of Reliability Matters. 